Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I'm going to start the presentation now. So let's go. And this is Empowering the Burn to Design. Uh, my name is Pete Blades. Um, I've been a vehicle designer now uh, in the automotive industry specifically for um, just over 10 years. So today, this is the, what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to unlock your hidden ideas that burn inside. So what does that mean? I've always been um, very passionate, very enthusiastic about design. And uh, for me, it's always been how do I get those designs out in a more efficient manner, in a fast manner, but also that satisfy me. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to, use it, we're going to look at Autodesk Sketchbook Pro, which is a very simple interface and a very simple design sketching tool. And then we're going to go into a very complex interface, which is alias Autodesk Automotive. And uh, these are going to hopefully help show some fast creative techniques to create the punchy sketch, which is really, really important to attract the looker and the client and the people. And uh, then I'm going to develop 3D visuals to inspire, which will be the output from the model. Um, and then these should hopefully captivate and stimulate your audience or your client. So I, it's a big, it's a big, uh, big, take a big deep breath and say, can, can I really hope that you will be able to do all these things? I hope so. I hope I can at least inspire you and uh, lead you on to explore these softwares. So the idea is to show you within the presentation the development of ideation techniques, create some impactful sketches. I'm going to do a sketch demo, which will be fast and efficient, but uh, not necessarily the most beautiful piece of work. But it will be able to show you the interface and how I work and my workflow. Um, again, that will be understanding the interface and create a quick model translation of 2D to 3D. I have prepared a design, which will, I won't necessarily be modeling the, the model, but I will show you some quick surfaces and some, some really key factors to enable you to translate a 2D doodle or a 2D sketch into 3D. And that's just a workflow. And at the end of it, of course, an impactful 3D visual. So uh, thank you for signing up. And this, if this class isn't for you, you can leave now. I've been told that that's a really good thing to say. So if you're embarrassed and you don't want to be here, you can go. <laughs> I just had a question. Yes. As an educator, I wanted to know what's your background? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm going to go into that in just one moment. No problem. Short history follows. So it's me. I'm a designer. I'm inspired by a lot of different things. I love motorcycles. I ride a KTM. And I have been training in martial arts for 10 years. And I do Wing Chun. And that's a very important factor of my life. So I'm 34, I'm British, and uh, not overly proud of being British, but I like being British. <laughs> and uh, for me, the four key words in my life, what I love is design. I'm really into detail, and that makes me specifically more of an interior car designer. Function is incredibly important for interior design, so that's also a very high factor. And uh, of course, I'm passionate, and passionate in design. So my current design position is, is currently I can't disclose it, but uh, my previous employment was at GM Design, and uh, then I worked for two years at Kia Design America, and uh, I graduated in 2003 from the Royal College of Art in London. And uh, of course, it's very important to also say my very beginnings were at Coventry University, where there's uh, often a lot of students to fight your way through to get to become a designer. So. This is just a short history. It's a, a quick board of um, design work that is um, marker renderings and hand drawings um, and to show you where I was prior to 2008. So where I was drawing, how I was drawing, and how I was communicating. And here's a, a very uh, sketch I did a long time ago for a Hummer, the H4, the HX. It was a long program a long time ago. Again, that's marker rendering and ballpoint sketches. Here is an illustration of a concept Corvette interior. And this was, uh, again, done through uh, markers and pen technique. And then I discovered Sketchbook Pro. And the big difference is vibrancy. The big difference was speed and material communication. So here's some, some of my work, which is sort of spanned across since 2008. And here's the material communication that's available or able, you're able to do with Sketchbook Pro. So from the softness of the leather to the stitching um, to uh, the, the, the chrome finishing and the materials and the metal finishing. 
So that was a big open eye. And you can see here, actually, you know, the very important thing is the line drawing. And you can see a quick description of that. And then I start to render up and, and display the materials. And there's another identifiable thing. I was able to take inspiration and, again, directly pick the colors, communicate the piano black finish uh, better than marker. And on top of that, Sketchbook Pro allows me to zoom in and get a higher level of resolution. The line drawing. Can't stress how important that is. For me, I have to work out my surfaces. I have to work out my intersections. I have to know what I'm doing. It's important because this is just a step. It's a 2D step into 3D. And if I'm communicating with a sculptor who's looking at a drifted, misty sketch, then I really haven't done my homework. I'm not able to communicate what I'm about because the product we're designing is not two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. That's what evokes the feeling. That's what expresses um, an emotive reaction from the customer. And then we render it up. This is a personal project um, that I did um, back in 2009. And I was in communication with McLaren. And it was really to, because they, they were just setting up and starting the automotive group. So I was very interested in talking to them and uh, had a successful time talking with them. However, it wasn't the direction for me. And the new McLaren F1 has just been revealed, and this was my take on it. And that was all done in Sketchbook Pro. No curves in the sense of paths or anything like that. That was a freehand sketch. So empowering the burn to design, I've been, uh, I, you know, when I chose this title, I got a call from Kevin Ketchum to put together this presentation. Kevin Ketchum is the Autodesk representative. Um, and he wanted me to do something that was fun, that was what I was about and that was important to me. And what's important to me is, is this energy that's inside me, this thing to get out, this power, this feeling of design. And so I wanted to talk about that. And it's simply put, how do I get my ideas out? Because I'm frustrated. I want to see things. I want to design. So I want to show you today, how do I do that fast and effectively? And of course, with a little X factor, because that little X factor helps people get excited. And then you get winning designs on the road or into production. But something's different today. It's never enough time just to sketch. In design, there's a changing movement. We have to make people believe sooner, quicker, and convince them faster. And a sketch is just not enough anymore. There is a sort of discussion within the studio I'm working in where there are resistant designers to being able to create three dimension at the early stage to explore their design. And that's a really important thing that we need to talk about because if design is going to speed up with the competition moving faster, cars coming to production quicker, we need to, as designers, be quicker, and that means translating our ideas more accurately quicker, which means that we have to learn how to do 3D sculpting. And that's, a, that's an important thing. So it's even better to make believe. So today I'm going to uh, demonstrate the techniques I use to quickly generate ideas, explore interface, and uh, how will I do this? I'll demonstrate the idea techniques and uh, show you how I let the pen wander. And that I'm going to show in a very static manner, but you'll see from a, ske a sketch build-up how I've done that. Then we're going to look at sketching with curves. How do I translate my 2D sketches into a 3D visual? And that really is done through um, using curves to describe my form in two views, then moving into the 3D view. So we wa what I'm asking to do really is to understand that Autodesk alias Automotive helps me to discover the design. It doesn't just enable me to build a model. For this right brain sort of presentation, it's about taking a creative mind and using alias not as an engineering tool, but how do I keep the passion going? How do I get excited about my product? How do I as a designer keep going in what I'm doing? And alias helps me do that. Curves of the secret is an area that we'll talk about, but then the most important thing is designers sometimes get this stifling. I did, certainly, when I started with Alias, is that as soon as I build a surface, I, feel I fall in love with it, or I think, is that right? I don't know. And I think the happy to trash slogan that I've put there is meaning don't become attached to your surfaces. Look, look again, look again, look again, throw it away, start again. If the curves are wrong, if the highlights are wrong, if things are not working, we need to go back to the curves and start again. So it's, and it, it's that understanding, that fact that it's a sketch still. It's not a final product. 
because the alias is so polished when you put the shader on. You think, I'm there, and you're not. <laughs> and I, uh, this model that I've produced for this, especially, is something uh, more creative so that I can express myself. So it's not an interior, and it's not a car. So it's something to show you that I'm passionate about design, and uh, I'm exploring that. And then, of course, in design, we sometimes, I mean, there's a lot of talk of showcase, and that is something I'm exploring as well, but not in this class. I think, um, you know, designers, we're often under the gun. Two weeks to design an interior, or one week to produce a quick sketch. But So, you know, the faster you get at producing that, uh, the, the quicker, you know, you can get decisions made and ideas into reality. Alias sometimes is a good enough package to be able to represent your idea by setting up shaders, setting up your lighting very quickly, and doing a quick environment, and that can create a very impactful visual that people can buy into. So we'll be looking at that, setting the shot, and outputting for presentation. So we'll start part one, and this is how to unlock your hidden ideas. Um, subject matter. The first thing I do, because I mean, I see a lot of people in the, in, in the next, next to me, they just start sketching. Um, and the, the, the challenge is to come up with something new, something fresh, uh, and not regurgitate. It's important to put subject matter in to keep yourself inspired and also to inspire others. And it also helps you ground and give you reason for why you're designing something. So it's easy to point back at things and say, yes, I, I color or surface or line or gesture, you know, um, or the attitude. All these words help to describe um, the form, and alongside that you put images that uh, coincide with these keywords or these feelings that help you then uh, produce your design and your model. So these are some of the images I put together for this, this design. So that's a Japanese fighting fish, an ice racer. Uh, that's a, a chair for G-Star Raw um, and uh, the KTM RC8R. So one thing in Autodesk Sketchbook Pro uh, you know, is the most important thing I often see missing in classes and things is setting up your Wacom. I use a Cintiq usually. Um, and uh, the most important thing is not to keep yourself on the keyboard when you're working on the Wacom. You want to eliminate that reach because you get shoulder strain because you're there for many hours. And I do suffer with a neck seizing. So I, I do want to talk, talk about setting up your Wacom. Um, and if you've downloaded the handout, I really recommend you do it. It's 50 pages long because I wanted it to be exciting. <laughs> so it's got lots of images. Um, but what's really nice about it is it talks about what I use. And it's very simple. Undo, redo, save. Um, and then spacebar, which allows me to pan and move, which I'll display when I do a demo. So the interface is more complex than this if you want it to be, but really, this is it. So you open the screen. You have the lagoon on the left-hand side, which is, enables you to quickly you can move that if you want to. But the canvas is, is really just a piece of paper, and you can start sketching. And why this? There's Sketchbook Designer. There's, there's Photoshop. This is a software that primarily enables me to get my ideas out without any complication of interface. It is the, how did I move from being in love with markers and hand rendering to a digital interface? This is the software that enabled me to do it. There is Sketchbook for industrial designers within the automotive interface. It's a brilliant, powerful tool. I, again, I'm a right brain. I don't want to be stopping my creative flow. I need my ideation to my hand-eye coordination to be non-existent in, as I'm drawing, so completely subliminal. As I'm draw drawing and designing, I need to find the ideas as they come out of my pen. I cannot be dealing with trying to find things and four steps before I can do a canvas. I need to open a canvas and start sketching. And that was, for me, a very important step. That's why I use Sketchbook Pro. So I'm going to go into the demo in a second, but this is just a quick demonstration of ideation sketches and how I build up. So I start with a gradient. Sometimes I find the white screen is very bright, disorientating. So I tend to go straight into a line drawing on a gradient, and then I just ideate with sketches. Just freehand, no paths. And then I build up with the brush tool, shadow. To, so I'm thinking about my light source and my light direction in a natural way. And then I go to lighter hues and accents. I start to bring in a screen effect, which is an effect within the layers, which is similar to Photoshop, but which is very nice in Sketchbook Pro because it's very easy to turn on and off. And then um, how do I do a different brush to create effects to give a little bit of pizzazz? By the way, if there's any questions as I'm talking, please do jump in at any time. 
So here's our blank canvas. I'm going to do a little bit of a sort of exploratory sketch. It's not going to be the best, but uh, we'll see how far we get. So first of all, I'm pressing down the space bar right now, and that gives me a sort of movement of pan, and then I can easily zoom, which makes it really nice. When I need to sketch different lines, I can also very quickly rotate the canvas clockwise, and again, the speed of it being able to do that, and I can then, because my wrist doesn't turn in different directions, I need to be able to very fluidly move. So that makes it very nice. If I lose the brushes, it's really nice. I just go down here to the lagoon, click it, on there, here again. There's presets, which are brushes pre-made by Sketchbook Pro, and those are also adjustable. If I double-click, I can then change those brush properties. By moving these sliders, I can actually change the... very, very quickly. Space is a fun one. So here's how I do bubbles, basically. <laughs> All right, I'm going to open um, that previous thing so you can see it a bit more clearly, uh, the previous sketch that I just showed in the PowerPoint. This, this is my Cintiq is the, the 21. This, I'm using, thanks to Kevin, he's lent me his wonderful whack on, which I practiced with last night. So. <laughs> okay, so here's the line drawing. So what's really nice, and this is what I said in my presentation, was... Um, the line quality. The one thing I struggled with Photoshop was it was jagged. It sort of, even if you move quickly, you didn't get this wisp or this fluidity of the pen line, and that for me is important. Line quality is very important, the accentuation. So these are exploratory sketches, just being free, and an idea is coming out slowly, and you can start to see. So I've labeled, the really nice thing about Sketchbook Pro is their layer interface. Um, if, I, if I show you this here, if I just turn on orange, for example, or let's, let's do paint one. You can see very quickly, it's quite straightforward. This is just a blocked in color set underneath the lines. So I, you know, working beneath the sketches, I have my uh, defined design idea, my sections are shown, um, and I just have to think about my light source. But what's really nice is when I get confused, <laughs> I don't have to worry too much about finding that new layer. I can easily edit that layer and label it. So here, for example, I can clear the image. I can even draw a paint bucket with paint coming out and a brush if I want to. And that is now my paint one. So I could do an image in there. I can, I can also just write paint one. Simple. So that helps me navigate. So back to the sketch. Paint two is just a, and now as I'm working, I'm not really thinking paint one, paint two. I'm just building up the layers. Um, and it starts to get more defined. going to keep going. So the multiply feature, which I'll go into when I actually do a demo, helps. Uh, it's basically a, tran a, a transparent uh, acetate that goes over the top of a previous paint, and it allows you to create depth and darkness to, to your painted drawing. Again, very nice. So there was a multiply layer just going on there. There is nothing wrong with also just changing the depth of the brush. It's just sometimes the workflow is natural just to switch on the multiply and keep working over a shadow that you've already worked. There's also a very nice trick, which I'll go into on the sketch demo, um, which uh, allows you to lock down the color so that if you've pr produced basically the underbelly and, and you want to just shadow on that piece of uh, paint, uh, you can just lock it down. So some bubbles screen layer, and then vibrancy. And there we are. That's good enough for me. And then I could go on to a, a more realistic sketch or um, develop a better higher level resolution rendering, um, or I can go into alias and start to explore. So let's open a, a sketch which I prepared. And I'm going to show you some brush tools very quickly. So how I started this sketch basically is a very rough, really fast, uh, 
nasty, fat pen, no worries, just to get the gesture. And as I bring up the line, I can drop down the opacity of that. And you can see I started to refine. So now I'm going to bring in some colors. Here I'm choosing my colors and my palette and just very quickly starting to refine and decide some, some hues just to set me off. I also just start with gray sometimes just to give me a starting point. I choose the brush tool, nice fat, and I can double click that and it brings up the brush properties and I can change the opacity of them. Very simple user interface. And then very quickly, I can start to block in. And again, this little brush puck is superb. It's one of the nicest things. It allows me to very quickly address the um, size of the, uh, um, of the, uh, the brush as I'm, as I'm moving in and out of the sketch. So I can very, very quickly just block in. You can see the feel is very, very nice. And usually, this is, this is basically all it is. It's just filling in, blocking in, checking it out, and this is maybe a little bit dull <laughs> for everybody. Does anyone have any questions? Is anyone thinking anything or wanting to know more? Yes and bring in a sketch that you previously ballpoint. Yes. Actually, um, I produced this sketch last night because I did previously have a file set up and it somehow didn't make it here. It got lost on the way. <laughs> yes, I did. So I'm, I'm not worrying too much because, again, I said I, d I don't use paths. A lot of people are creating paths, um, selecting them and chopping back, um, you know, deleting their selection through their path control. For me, it's faster to just very, very quickly just move my hand and, and use Control Z all the time. You can do. I tend not to. <laughs> it really is about painting, uh, drawing, and you know, there are techniques that you can do on this that, again, are very easy to explore. Um, yeah, you can, do, you can do that too. Yes, there is a significant difference. Um, this is a very stripped down interface, and that's its purpose. Um, it's not about um, vector control or line control, which is what designer can enable you to do. They have a, it's like a, almost a combination of the Adobe softwares of Illustrator and Photoshop together. However, they, you know, the, the interface is still simpler on uh, designer. And I have used that too, and sometimes I've had problems with this software at work where they haven't installed it on the machine, but sketchbook design is on there. So I can use that too, and it's as, as, as simple, but it is just more in depth. And again, I'm a designer. My job is not illustration. Um, my job is ideation. And the fastest way I can get my ideas out is what I need to do. Um, you know, and whether or not um, you know, the, the rendering is there are, of course, people better than myself at rendering faster and creating a more illustrative. Uh, looking design, but the reality is the product in the three dimensions, and the, the the skill set or the way I split my time up is to be able to get into 3D now faster, so that I can work closer with my sculptor. Because the you know it, it comes down to a very simple fact that as you're working with your sculptor, he needs answers. He's not he is a creative sculptor, but he needs answers. He needs to know what your sections are doing, and if you haven't explored them through your sketch, and you don't have the answers, you have to go back to your your desk. And, and then come up with the answers. And sometimes sketching is too slow. You need to be able to do a curve in space. You nowadays need to work three-dimensionally with them to help develop your design. That is, in my opinion, <laughs> a, a future that we, we, uh, we need to explore and, and people need to be aware of. Absolutely. I mean, usually it's actually a little bit more involved than that. Um, you know, in interior design, it's the A-pillar door to IP intersection, IP being the instrument panel. 
it's that complex um, communication of how those uh, three-dimensional elements in the interior come together. Um, and if you don't discover those in yourself, how that's happening, um, you, you know, there's transitions that are highly complex. So you have to look at, is your design going to work in this, is your sketch going to work in the three dimensions, basically? Yes. Yes. Okay, so now that I've put uh, just a quick base on it here, I'm going to lock that layer down like I was describing to show you that tool. So I, I, I just press down on this little flower here, lock it down. You can choose the airbrush tool. I double click. I don't want too much flow. It's on 10, it's on 12, whatever. That's not too much. That's fine. And I can choose a slightly darker thing, and I can just drift that under now to start bringing some tone. And see how it's not painting outside of that? It's just staying on that layer and allowing me to build up. And again, I can take the eraser. I think I can take the eraser sometimes. Nope, that doesn't allow me to do it. So then I go back, turn it off, and then very, it's a bit too much. So I want to go double click the eraser, the amount to raise, drop it down. It's fine. So let's bring some. Again, you see how I just put a layer? I just created a layer by pressing down and flicking up. It becomes very natural, natural feel. Uh, very easy to move, but it, I actually want it below the line drawing. So I just move it down using this little tool here. Just press and hold and pull. Sorry, say again? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, you can do that all the time. Yeah, and, and you know, the picture is a, is, a, as a, is a story going along, and you change it, and you edit it, and you move it, and you know you uh, you don't have to stick to any rules. You know, there's many 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 ways to change the image after you've finished drawing it, changing the hues. In the actual Sketchbook Pro 6, which I don't have because it comes with the Alias Automotive package, I use this version, which has got some. It's 5.5 version 5.5. Um, so it doesn't have all the uh, new tools that Sketchbook Pro 6 has, which is uh, getting better and better. Hi. Uh, yes. If I say that again, sorry. Yes. That's right. So I didn't go outside of the lines because what that layer does, it, when you flick up and you lock it down, I'll demonstrate it again, just one second. Let me finish this bit of orange. <laughs> Are people finding this interesting? Is this, is this helping? OK, cool. I need some feedback. <laughs> Get some thumbs up at the back from Autodesk. That's not good, people. They already have thumbs up. I'm enjoying this. I, you know, I th I, my friend Julian doesn't sketch anymore. He just does alias. <laughs> I, I think he's bored. <laughs> Are you bored, Julian? <laughs> OK. So I'm going to demonstrate that again. Let me just fill in a, a, another, another piece and, and do another thing so I keep moving. This, I'm going to use this drawing. So I, 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 you know, I'm actually doing some work here. So um, you know, you're going to have to be patient with me. Again, the really cool thing, right? Zoom out. You can just take, make the brush big. Boom. Uh, don't want that there. Let's, uh, let's go here. Just move the layer so I don't have to erase too much. Again, I'm concentrating all my information around the tail area, because around this area, because the rest of the sketch is going to fade away, because later on, which I won't finish here, but later on it will... It'll be look more, uh, you know, faded out distance. Something we learn in automotive design is please don't give us the full sketch. We want to imagine it. So I tend not to uh, try to draw everything nowadays. I mean, I learned a lot uh, in, you know, because because I can imagine everything. <laughs> That's not actually what's almost always required. <laughs> People don't want to be shown everything. They want some mystery. So we drift it out, and also because of perspective and things like that. This is a really cool tool. Um, using the ruler tool, I can very very quickly pull that ruler into place using these uh, white control points. And I can line that up. Even though it has section, I can see that. I can just move. I've, I've chosen the, the rule tool right now. But I could choose the ellipse tool, which allows me to have section. 
you can see, I can very quickly control. So again, I'm going to okay, I use the ellipse now. A lot of my sketches, actually, how I build up very quickly is I can use this like a French curve, which is basically a, a guide um, as I'm drawing. And you can use that. When you zoom out, you suddenly the ellipse is huge. And you can actually create very nice um, curves. And so instead of using paths, I'll use this tool to create good line quality. Um, some, some of the McLarens were a lot more work than this little sketch, but um, a lot of the, the sweeps were used using this method. And this, uh, sometimes I, I can create an interior very, very quickly um, by um, using the tool. So there we go. That's really nice. Very quick a way to do it, and it's good enough. And I can just mop up my mess. So to go back to that question and um, answer what you would like to know, I haven't forgotten. When I, when I add tone or color to this layer, I can stay on this layer without locking it down and paint over what I've done. However, sometimes it's quicker just to lock down the layer, which is what I'm going to do now. So I go to this little flower. Now here, these, th these things here, you can see it's it's, it's um, popping up multiply blend mode. This is what I talked about earlier about darkening. Screen mode creates a highlighted, or if you like, a, a, a luminosity to the paint that you're using on top of a previous layer. Um, uh, I don't use that. And then normal blend mode is what I'm currently on. This is the lock transparency. So on that layer, oops, one moment. On that layer, it's now locked down. I choose my airbrush. And... I can choose a tone, a darker one, or let's go with something a little bit green. Uh, let's go, uh, yeah, it's locked down. So now here's my airbrush. And now if I paint here, nothing. It's, 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 it's enabling me to just very, very quickly. And of course, as a designer, there's all sorts of decisions going on right now. It's like, I don't like that green, and why did I do that green? So I can very, very quickly change that and keep on that locked layer and go to black and just tone it in again. The only problem is, <laughs> if I wanted to now, um, I can control Z, go out. Let's say, let's say you know, naturally, I've made a mistake. See, I'm, you can set how many control Zs you want. Luckily, I'm within it. It's fine. I can duplicate that layer. So if I mess up, it's okay, I've still got this guy. Turn him off, so I've got him if I make a mistake, which is what I do do to sometimes. Um, go back into here and go back to where I'm comfortable. And I, did, I forgot to lock, so go back, lock it. Now, for me as a designer, I mean, it's funny because there's so, so many designers in the automotive industry are very comfortable with Photoshop. They, again, they, they don't want to move from, um, from that software. But you know, each to their own, there is a freedom in it. But this software is phenomenal for me, being a, much more of a right brain thinker, which is what I like to talk about. Um, within, again, I'm turning on the lock layer. And there I am, just putting some more darkness in here. And I'm controlling how my sketch is coming along, really. I'm starting to fill it in. So this is, you know, let's put some, some highlight on. Because we've got a gradient, gradient in the background, um, you know, it's quite nice to start dropping in some white tone. Again, I double click, I bring up the brush property, super fast, super nice. Um, and I can just very quickly go into white, and then I can zoom out a little bit and just start drifting it. And I'm not worrying where it goes right now. I'll come back with the eraser. Soft, soft eraser is a nice feature. They give you a hard eraser, which is what I've been using to clean up my edges, like this. You can see very, very quickly. The zoom in is so nice. Here we go. So again, right down. One has to remember as a designer, you know, we can zoom in and look at these things, get really tight in in, in, a, in a software, but often a sketch, they, you know, the directors will pick a, a thumbnail. <laughs> And they'll pick it 
ne next to this mostly polished rendering. So sometimes, you know, it really pays not to, not to think of yourself as an illustrator, but really do think of yourself as a designer and what are you trying to communicate? And uh, this is just about exploring the undercarriage, the sectioning, um, and what's going on for me in, in, in the design. So it's, now I'm gonna do another layer. I want block white, so I've changed the brush. I'm gonna erase something. This is gonna be a decal, but I'll tone it down in one second. Now I can use the ellipse tool again. But my tendency is always to go back to freehand. I just, that's how I work and how I enjoy sketching. Take the soft array again to hold click, amount erased, and then I can it's got a bit of a section change, so I just want to show a little bit of shadow maybe and just take a little bit of that white off. Give it a bit of three-dimensionality. Again, go back to the airbrush tool. Um, I'm still on white. Go back to this layer. <coughs> Any more questions? Anything? Is there a sequence you can do in the for example, uh, all these are first and highlights Yeah, that's what I tend to do. But, you know, I, I've learned a lot by looking at how other designers, um, from Jay Schuster to Daniel Simon, they, they seem to have a technique that, that really, um, it, it, you know, you can go from light to dark. You can go from dark to light. It just depends on where you are as in the day. For me, it's about describing the, the, the form and the shadow. So I have to think about my light source. Where is it coming from? Sometimes I'll even put arrows in the drawing to remind myself, especially if I want more than one light source. Um, of course, we're, we're submerged here or we've got darkness beneath because of the gradient. So that tells me my light source. It's also a useful tool because of the gradient's there, it's a reminder. I, it's darker below, it's lighter above, it's pretty simple. The light's more bright over in this top corner. So that's where my light's coming from. So I've picked up here. This is all underneath the fuselage. So to describe that this is a centrally mounted fin, um, I wanted to show shadow underneath the, the, the fuselage here, the main body. And so that's, that's sort of automatic for me. I just tend to um, start working that. Now I notice this little, little guy here, little padlock, it's locked. Unlock it, go back in. And then I can pick my color. Pressing Alt, I know I want this tone or this color, and I want to put it in here. So I'm going to very quickly just pick here, go out, come in, and very quickly address. Now, the funniest thing is, um, I mean, I've got some GM friends here who, who know, who've known me when I started in 2004. That's when I came to America. And I was predominantly marker sketching. Um, and I have a friend called Micah Jones who I sat next to. I resisted. I resisted to draw digitally. And Micah Jones can sketch like a whiz kid on this software. And it was, it was looking at what he was doing that you learn from. So I have to say, you know, you, as you go through your career, you pick up on um, techniques and ways of um, working from your associates and your contemporaries. And I think it's, it's always it's very modest and important to recognize that um, these people um, affect you and, and help you. As I mentioned earlier, Julian is also another person that's affected me and, and helped me learn alias um, as I've been growing as a designer. As a right brain, predominantly creative, it's <laughs> alias is not the most intuitive at first, but once you, once you grasp it, it's the most powerful tool. You, it makes you realize, as a designer, anything is possible. And if you can think it, you can make it. Oh, um, the layers, if they disappear, press and hold the Wacom tablet. Usually you want to be using a Wacom for sketching. So I, you can press and hold one of the buttons. So you can assign, it's automatically assigned within the software and pull down. There's several ways to get it. So this is layers and gone. And also in this tool here, I think actually, yeah, because I never use it. Hang on one second. <laughs> I think it's in here somewhere. There it is. So over here with the hammer and the spanner, there's a tools thing. The other tools that um, are very useful for pattern makers, I believe I read that there was someone from Floor or uh, some association with um, uh, patterns or things like that. I think a good thing to do over here, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration of how 
you can use the symmetry tool to create patterns if you wanted to in an exploratory way. So I'm just going to pause this for a moment. I'll save it. And I just want to address the symmetry tool. So I've shown you the ellipse guide. I've shown you the ruler tool, airbrush, lockdown layers. Other tools like multiply and screen I'll come back to if people want to, but I need to move on. So I'm going to just quickly show you the symmetry tool. And here, I'm just invisibling the layer. They're not deleted. I'm just getting rid of them. So I can just do a, a fresh layer. I don't know what I'm doing, but that's the symmetry tool. <laughs> very, very powerful, very, very quick. The coolest thing is you can turn them both on. Again, I don't know. <laughs> I don't do this so much, but uh, you know, this shows you the power of the tool, and I think that's important uh, today to show that. Sorry? I can't hear that. Oh, sorry, symmetry. It's at the top here. It's symmetry horizontal, symmetry vertical. Click it on, click it off. Okay. So, sketch demo. I can keep going, but I think we should move on. Um, I can come back to it if people want to. Um, but let's... Uh, Let's so move there's no on. way to do it. I mean, a fill or an enclosed area? I tend to just paint it in. No, not so much a fill, no. I mean, if, as I said, you've, what you can do, if I just go back to the line drawing, um, and because I didn't label it, I have to search for it now. <laughs> there we go. So uh, put a layer underneath, zoom out, fill is as quick just by choosing your brush and zooming it in, boom, fill. You know, okay, if you want it to be not so much work, then be a little bit more careful. But that's quick. Again, masking is possible um, with the marquee tool, which is this tool here. So for example, I want to just choose this. Very intuitive. There's, I hope this answers your question. I think it will, yeah. except it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> It's the lovely thing uh, about Sketchbook Pro. Um, the software programming allows the drift of the pen, the line weight, and the sensitivity of the Wacom work very, very well together. So it's programming. And because the program's very light, it's 50 meg or something, it's not huge. It, it, it doesn't have a complexity to it. Again, I think there's that's something I'm not doing right here, because I don't use it. I don't, and if it confuses me like that, it's a great example. I just move on and paint it. So I think you can do something like that, but it's more about cutting. Oh, sorry? No, it's just moving as soon as I select a tool. I have an idea. Maybe I can use it to cut. Yes, I can. So let's do that. So let's say I want this. Cut. All right, there you go. <laughs> that helps. So we do it the reverse way. You're not masking an area. You're reversing. You're thinking, you can also do this. This is really cool. This is the move tool. Okay, so my line wasn't perfect. It doesn't matter. Move it. Didn't cut it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, the flow is what's important. The speed and the movement of your drawing. You know, it's, it's, the tools are there to enable you to forget them. It, it is about your design, and that's what's important. Okay, so are we okay to move on from Sketchbook Pro? I want to move into some more complex stuff. So we've got the contrast. That's what's really exciting. So that's what we just looked at. We looked at the buildup of the layers. So hopefully, from the ideas and the, the selection of subject matter, the imagery that you, I'm going to walk around, the imagery that you, you choose or the subject matter that you are stimulated by as an individual, it's a very personal thing, design. It's very important to know what you like and what you don't like. And if you're designing something that has to be current or futuristic or more uh, historically based, it still needs some modern twist to it. We still need to see something fresh. So it's important to get subject matter together. I compile a library of imagery so I can select through and appropriately create my image board. So that's understanding creative ideation techniques in a fast manner. You know, you're, you've got to put subject matter in to get something out. That's me. This may be different for you. You may be a genius and come up with fresh ideas all the time, but you need to have a way to stimulate yourself so you get excited about your work. 
um, fast volume sketches. I was using the paint tool with it to be able to describe the volumes and the forms, creating shadow, choosing my light source. Um, and then you now, hopefully, just a basic understanding of the Sketchbook Pro interface. It is really intuitive. It's almost, I've spent so much time on it, I feel guilty because it's so simple. It really was easy to pick up. Um, and line weight, the question to answer, well, how did I get my line weight? It's, it's down to programming. Um, and then color blocking and light source, blocked in the color, white drifting with airbrush, highlighting, and then multiply and screen I didn't touch on, but I, I can come back to it, but I'd like to move on. It's basically selecting uh, a feature on the layers which uh, is like a translucent feeling. And it's, it's just the same as painting, it's just changing the properties of the layer. If necessary, I'll come back to that, but I'd like to move on. So in the handout, there's tons of information. I'm super detailed. That's one of the things I said at the beginning. Please do download it. It was a three-day lock-in for myself working on that. And I would like people to enjoy it and read it. And it's got some nice way of, uh, I've, I've written it in a way that's not dry. It should be quite en enjoyable to read. OK, so we looked at the ellipse, the ruler guide, symmetry tool, the marquee tool, and some of the things I've moved around. And uh, mirror canvas. That's very important, just to touch on that. The symmetry tool, this is not something, this yellow that I'm showing here is just me doing a color to dis display the symmetry feature. I can do a quick rear view or you know, front view. Faces of cars are very important. The rear, rear, rear of a car is very important for identity. And this can help me work those graphics very quickly because it enables a face to come, you know, eyes, nose, mouth, it, it, you know, or the dynamic. Is it an angry face? Is it a happy face? Uh, you know, what, what, are we, what are we trying to get at? So that software really enables me to do that in automotive design. And also creating fresh eyes, when you're doing a 3D sketch, doing a perspective, you can lock yourself into falling in love with it and you need to step back and come back to it. You can step away, but you can also very, very quickly, if you have to keep moving, mirror the layer and you can see straight away where you've made some errors. So you're creating fresh eyes. Again, techniques. So there we go. And the lock transparency function, which ans answered your question. <sighs> Autodesk alias. Um, I'm going to show you my interface routine. I'm going to show you marking menus, which are the ones that come with Autodesk Automotive. It is a completely customizable interface. So I'm not going to customize it because I will later on when I'm better at alias. I'm still on my journey with it. I'm still learning it. It is a dense program, but it is exciting. So for, the, for you guys, if you go and Involve yourself with Autodesk Automotive um, Design Program. You need to explore these things, but don't get caught up with trying to change too much at first. Just get into the program. I think that's really important. Um, and again, uh, you know, some of these things are quite emotive. Curves are the secret. They really are. If your surface is wrong, your curves are wrong. That's it. So don't go into surface too fast. Make a 3D model in curves. So it's like sketching in 3D. If you change your right brain creative mindset from thinking about it as an engineering tool or thinking about it must have perfect highlights from the beginning, it must be, it must be right straight away, or you know, I want to see the immediacy of it, you will get caught up and lost within the program. So these are the key things, changing the views. So I've highlighted side, side view, F6. These are the hotkeys. These are the important things for moving when you're sketching your curves. Plan is F5. Um, Perspective F8. These are the three views I use most of all. Rear comes in later, and front comes in later for me. Diagnostic shading is for surfacing. That's when I start to make my surfaces, and I want to see what the light is doing on my surface. Because basically, a surface is reflecting light. It's, that's it. It's, it's just responding to the environment. Um, curve, curve and surface construction editor is a little complex. I'll talk about that later. Um, but view curve and surface construction. This is about understanding, again, curve and surface construction editor. It's about understanding what the math behind the surface and behind the curve makes up the control of that surface. Once we understand the math in a very simple way, we can then edit it to achieve um, continuity, the big one. But we'll, we'll go into that later. So changing the views, sketching with your curves, changing the views is very important because now the brain has to um, not just sketch with the hand, but learn to... Uh, Relate your two-dimensional understanding in 3D, and the way to do that is to give it time. You have to look. You look, look, look again, look again, zoom out, 
zoom in, walk away, look again, and readdress and assess. That's it. It's, that's the secret for me. It's just keep looking, keep searching. The rule of PSD. You know, I learned this from a sculptor at um, Kia Motors. And he said, it's, it's, it's something I should know. <laughs> and he was right. But it was something I hadn't really put down to a, an abbreviation. And I, I picked up on it, and I like to use it. I think, you know, for a designer or for someone who wants to translate a 2D sketch, it's just, you know, this is the order. Proportion first in your curves. Get your volumes right through understanding proportion. Surface comes later. And it comes when you feel your proportion is right. But you know what? The good thing about Alias is it's, it's got history, it's editable. Um, you can change it to your surfaces to go back to better proportion if you find that you want to change something or something's not working. And then detail comes last of all, and that really is not necessary to look at. And the secret, again, lies in the curves. This is, again, for designers, not Alias engineers or Alias surface sculptors. This is about how do I translate my 2D thinking into 3D. Um, this is a movement that I think needs to happen as, as younger students are coming out of college, the pace of the automotive industry or design industry. It's actually imperative for every designer to grasp a three-dimensional tool and to really learn how to vocally communicate with a sculptor or a digital sculptor, but also um, understand what they're doing in their sketch. Because I don't know how many times I've sketched something that lies to me. It's lying. And when I put it into 3D, I then have to find another solution because it doesn't look good or it doesn't work. And that's really important. So PSD is also another software's filing saving thing, so it's very easy to remember. So curve editing, the curves that I use. That's it. Two degree, three degree, five degree. No more. I also use only one tool, and that is the curve edit tool. I'm missing a layer. OK, so this is curve editing. So what, when I've made my curves, which is 2D, 3D, 3 degree, or 5 degree, I, I have to be able to sketch with them. So I have to be able to shorten lines. Often I'm using an eraser in a, in a sketchbook program. So I use curve section to be able to shorten my curves. To extend my curves, I use the extend tool, which can also be used for surfacing, um, and alignment, which it gives me tangency, or it gives me curvature, and it gives me um, uh, positional. Okay, so side view, then plan view, then perspective. So I start very simply translating a side view in alias, and then I start to move my curves, using the, picking the CVs and moving them in 3D. The important thing that I find when looking, and I call it sketching in curves, is the little CVs get sort of distracting. They get frustrating as a sort of creative person. So I turn them off. And you see, you see I've turned off the curve construction CV and hull so I can read the curve as if it's a sketched pen line. It's, it's a brutal start. I use two degree curves. I go whack, 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 and I look at it. Something there. You have to start. And that's important. Limit the amount of math data that you're putting into your curves so that you can control what you want to do later on. And because of the curve construction editing tools, you can go up to 3 degree, 5 degree, and into the realm of no, you don't do that many CVs if you want to. But the biggest thing is keep it simple for yourself. So here, this is, I'm going to go into the demo in a second with the actual file and uh, take you through it. But here's, again, like I did the sketching, you can start to see the side view. And here I put some surface on. And I'm just reviewing it and assessing it. Put in a, you know, the, the, the actual tail fin, the construction of the math for the highlights has to be larger uh, than the actual tail itself. I don't make it to the, the actual defined point. I want to make sure the highlights run correctly. Um, and uh, you can start to see I start to assign shaders and things so I can start to look at materials as I'm working. This is what's so lovely about Alias is that at the end of it, you have three views. Straight away, you've got, you've got lots of infinite perspectives. And on top of that, you have the chance to apply materials and colors and break up. So you can start looking at graphics and everything all at the same time. So you're no longer doing stages. It's all happening at the same time. And it gets you excited. And you, you get more passionate as you go. So the gesture of the design starts to come together. And they start to really feel what's going on. Asking me how this works is a good question, because I'm still discovering. I don't know how it works, but I'm enjoying building it, and I'm enjoying making it. It's more of an entertainment design piece, uh, something that's more um, 
free of the constraints of automotive packaging. So it's just an exploratory model. This, in fact, is my second alias model, full second model. Uh, my first was the engagement ring for my fiancé. So I'm going to go back and just do the demo now. So let's, uh, let's go into that. Here we are. OK, so here's me using the hotkeys. So I go into my side view. And then I'm holding down keys, and I'm going to start zooming in and panning out. So I so talked about turning off the CV hulls. So over here is the control panel. Right now, I don't need that. The other thing that curves, we like line quality as we're sketching. Curves have a tolerance or a quality. And you see here, this is an important little feature. Again, this is all in the handout, so do download the handout. And if you hit quality, now draw precision is about how it's represented in the, in the screen. And the curves can have a jagged look, like an anti-aliasing look, or it can have um, a high quality. So if I put draw precision up, You can see, uh, well, like you, it actually in, improves the line of the curve. I didn't demonstrate it, but if there's a lot of surface in the file and you put draw precision up to high, you're going to have a lot of redraw and it's going to be more complex. So really, this is just for sketching. So I just whack the draw precision up straight away. When it comes to surfacing, the tolerance, 0 0.002. Again, this is in the handout, and that's good enough. That's for the diagnostic shading tolerance, not the tolerance of surfaces meeting. So now I go into plan view, and you can see I already started to pull a CV here to look in, in 3D. Um, so if I go to perspective view now, you can start to see let me see if I can just change this quickly. There we go. Nice and clean. All right, so we have a straight curve. We have inside view. We have all those CVs. I'm looking at this one here. If I just pick the curve. You can start to see that's the curve, completely straight. But I don't want it straight. I can plan view. Pick nothing. Sorry. Pick CV. Again, this is a little, you know, I'm going over the, I haven't gone into the interface too much with the marking menus and things like that. Again, I'm leaving that to the, to the, um, pick two curves there, sorry. I'm leaving that for you to read into, into the handout and things, but it's really important for you to um, just have a look at how I'm doing things. So I'll address that. Now, if I do something odd, like I don't pick those CVs together and I move one because I want more crown here, and then I go, but I want this one to move further over here, and then I go, oh, I want that to come in here. Now, let's go and have a look. <laughs> now we have something really nasty going on. <laughs> this is very important to understand. It has to be a straight line. That curve has to track like a tape line on a car. If you want to control your surface so that it doesn't OJ or it, 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 OG, it, it needs to not twist. It needs to run refined and controlled. And that's, this is what sketching with curves is all about. It's about coming in, moving that, lining it up. Done. Good enough. It's lined up in one view. Now we have something that we can make a surface with. It's also important to remember when we're building our curves that these holes relate to each other. So when I created this curve and I created this curve, they're actually the same curve, just duplicated. But now that I've moved this one, this first curve that I've just done, I have changed its relationship to the other surface. So if I build a surface between these two curves, the construction will be strange because there's no relationship between the curves. Okay, so that, that basically is the start of how to start moving your curves. But I talk about editing curves. So let's go into side view. Let's say now that I've moved, let's just hide this curve so it doesn't distract. So I've just templated it. And I'm going to take and hide the CV points 
So now that's gone. In fact, you know what? I'll do it on all of them and then bring them up as I want. So I just select all of them, turn them off, and now, look, I just have a, a line drawing, a pen drawing, if you like. Treat it like that in your mind. And you see that this, this curve here is overhanging. So I go to a, the tool here, which is called under the curve edit area, and it gives me trim, segment, and slice. I just want to trim. The good thing is it adjusts the, it adjusts the uh, CV's position, which allows me to keep a crown or whatever's on there. So here they are. Pick curve. I'm going to curve section. Enter. That's the curve I want to edit. And then trim. And now that is now trimmed according to that that side, but of course in 3D space it's not connected. So let's extend it. Or let's actually let's move it. Let's let's do some moving. Again, remember I'm moving one CV, so how is that looking? It's looking fine. So looking, checking. Let's just snap it there. Let's have a look. Okay, so this this curve is now so I want to control that guy, keep that guy happy. I don't want to move him in 3D space anywhere else other than along the line of the curve. So I use this tool, which is quite nice. It's slide, and that allows me just to move that CV. Okay, so I've start, I keep looking at the curves. Now it's connected. The one thing that a lot of designers can do is they can put curves in space, um, but the most important thing to be able to then build the model is connect those curves up. They have to connect to build a surface. So it's important to understand that connection and understanding that connection is important. So we just looked at curve section to be able to edit your curve. Um, we moved it to edit the curve, to put it into position. But you can also extend curves, and you can um, reduce curves. Extend doesn't always mean um, going one way. Here it is extending, keeping the character of the curve, but also I can take it back along its, along its path, which is really nice. It's really versatile. I can also, from that, within the extend tool, I can take extrapolate off, and I can go linear, and I can extend straight. Of course, it's created a curve. The curve math data is 1, so we need to at least minima minimally put it to 2 to give me a control point. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, if I wanted to move that curve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I do is, one of the ways alias works, one of the basics, again, is talked about in the handout, which is the pivot tool. Um, if, uh, the, if the pivot is in space somewhere, the curve will only move according to the position of that pivot. It's like its homing device. So if I want to position that curve along that arc, along this main arc here, I must move the pivot first. So I'm going to move pivot. So set pivot. Put it there, move, and then I'm moving the curve. And see these snap points that Alias produces? So there, is that, is that answering your question? Yes. Okay, good. If there are any questions, please do just shout them out. I'm not the best at Alias, but I enjoy it. So I'll do my best to answer them, but there's plenty of experts in here, I'm sure, that can answer them for you. <laughs> okay, so this was you know, a very early file. This was the first file. So I'm going to open a second file now. This is the model taking a little bit more of a stage in curves. You can start to see in 3D space. And here you see a different feeling. I turned off the grid. So let's toggle it on again. OK, we feel happy. It's, it's now in space. <laughs> but all these things um, you know, are versatile in Alias to be able to adjust, so to simplify the environment for you. Um, earlier in the week, um, yesterday, there was a talk on Alias and Intro, and he talked about layers. I don't want to address that, but it's just like Photoshop, in a sense, or even Sketchbook Pro. Organize your curves, your surfacing, or parts of your model through the layers, and these are found at the top. And you just go to the layers at the top here, File, New, and you have a layer. You can assign. You can assign. You can pick objects through the layer. For example, if I pick this curve and this curve, and I want to assign them, press and hold. A sign, if I don't want to see them, visit invisible. Really, really versatile. Really nice. OK, going to open another file. I'm going to start moving forward now. <laughs> now, starting to get a little bit more complex. And here you can.
can see I've put in a gradient in the background. Now, I'm going to go through that in the, in the third stage, um, which will show you how, that's, how it, that's done, and also how to output an image from alias for sketching on, or even just for presentation if the model's good enough. But going into the complexity of um, how all these surfaces are made um, would be a little bit too much to try and cover in uh, 90 minutes. However, I would like to just um, start talking about surface. So I'm going to go back into um, the PowerPoint presentation for a moment and take a look at what we just looked at and talk about the treasuring. So with, a, with the right brain creative, we have to love what we're doing. So for me, I treasured a part of my model. Um, I focused on the tail, um, which allowed me to visualize what I was feeling um, and to get me excited to keep moving and moving on. So, you know, the designer has to have a relationship with what he's making. And it's a 2D keyboard mouse interface. You can't touch it. So you have to somehow become emotional with it. So find a part of the sketch that you're excited to see, build it, build it look at it, address it, change it, until you find something you like. I have to say, this thing is not complete. It's going to keep going after this, this uh, presentation. So basic surfaces. Uh, we're going to go into a quick demo. Um, query edit is a very important thing to be able to edit your surfaces. Um, and I tend to use these three surfaces. Skin, I tend to use as a very, very quick way of uh, checking how something looks. I throw it away. It, I use it if I need it later on, and I can add math to it. Basically, any surface can be changed to what you want it to be. You can up the math, down the math. It's just how you apply that surface and then control it uh, within continuity. So each surface tool is there for depending on how you want it to relate to another surface. It's really complex, but it's very simple once you spend more time in, in Alias. OK, so I'm going to go into uh, the quick demo of a surface construction. This is heavy. I've never done this before. This is, uh, this is quite complex. <laughs> All right, so let's cut out of this. Let's go into, um, let's make a, a, new, a new thing. The lovely thing about Alias is its stages. This is a, um, a box that you can pull up which allows you to know that Alias has uh, like, 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 like layers. It has like many theater stages. And you can open different models on those stages and go to them and look at them within the same alias package. So you can see, I don't know if you can see that, but this green model is on a different stage. So it's not pickable. It's not really there. It's just telling me that the stage is open. And I'm going to make it invisible. It's still there. I've just made it invisible. So in side view, let's make a curve. Again, I only use edit point curves. Double click, I'm going to use a two. Go, that's two clicks. I'm pressing Alt. That snaps the grid. Pick CV, move. Gives me an arc. Very, very simple. Pick curve. Just change the mass to a three degree. So that curve is now a three degree curve. This is the construction tool editor for curves. And you can use it for surfaces. But right now, I'm just going to keep it a tool, a two. Moving into plan, move the curve. Again, if I want to um, snap, uh, or just, it's in space, it's in vertical space in Z. So I'm not going to snap it to grid, otherwise it'll go back down to this, the, the, the bottom, to the floor. So I'm just going to pick the curve, move it. And these are called marking menus, which I'm using. Again, it's a, it's a, a customizable interface, but it's a fast way to move in Alias if you're new to Alias. Um, again, covered in the handout, um, it explains that you're holding down certain keys, and then you're using the, the three, three mouse buttons to be able to move around it. So here is my pickable, this is my editable, and this is my visualize tool, or also to query. I use query edit all the time, so that's my third mouse button. So to duplicate this curve, to create a surface, I go edit. It's nice and easy. Duplicate mirror. I'm going to go across the XZ axis, which you get better at knowing. But even when you're in alias and doing things, you sometimes get confused about which is X, which is Y. Z is always up, so it's, it's nice. Um, and here we've got a very straightforward surface. And I can use a skin tool. Because I can finish this, I'm just going to unplug this guy and get rid of it. OK. 
So surfaces, skin, bang, there's a surface. If I turn the surface on, it has math. But it's very, very simple. Now, what just happened? I just changed history. I ignored how that surface was created. Now it's gone blue. So if I pick that surface and I want to query edit it, no history. And also, because I didn't apply what I just changed in my construction editor, I didn't even get the change. But that doesn't matter. I can go back in. Sorry, pick surface. Change it to a 3. And then I click, yes, I want that. And now I have an editable surface with holes. Now I can change that more. And I'm going to explain what history is in, in one moment. Now I've got more control. Now the surface is getting heavier. Again, this was a, uh, as you see, the original curves are a two degree. Doesn't matter if the curve is two degree, three degree, if you change the surface, the surface is a separate entity. Yes, it's connected to the curve. When we start modeling, we want our surfaces to retain history and work with our curves. Sometimes we don't. We want to be able to move the CVs to feel the highlights out. So it's dependent on the workflow that a design sculptor works. I work differently from Julian. Julian works differently from Matt. There's different people that, that uh, work in Alias, and they, they use the software to enable them to build surface. So it's completely editable. OK, so let's look at a square. Or actually, let's do a, a higher degree curve. Again, I can double click that key, choose a three degree straight away, holding Alt, create the curve, duplicate the curve, just by going Edit, Duplicate, Mirror, pick another curve. Control copy, control V, pivot's already set. There it is. Pick the curves, move them into space. Side view. Picking CVs, move. Now, I've moved the same thing, same gesture. However, I want this surface to also have some curvature. So I go, actually here I'm going to go into the end view, repick, so I can pick the two, give that crown two. And so I can center pivot, make this surface. See how this, each curve has its own pivot? If I now group that, it becomes one, scale, ungroup, Back to normal, back to individual curves. So the square tool means you have to have four sides, so we have four curves. On the skin tool that we just used, we just used it to go between something, two curves. And my surface was created. We can't see it. Why can't we see our surfaces? Diagnostic shading. This immediately throws in our surface, we can now assess it and now judge it. Different tools in here allow us to see what the highlights are doing. This is like a piece of white foam core with black tape on it that you're then reflecting off a surface. And that gives me um, an idea of what my surface is doing and how it's highlighting. Now, this surface has history. So if I query edit that, which is this tool here, this yellow one here, it opens up the, the control box. And at the moment, there is no relationship to any surface around it, which is going to be talked about in the class after this. There's a lot more complexity to um, alias to allow surfaces to work together, because there's always a relationship between surfaces, because we're making a volume. Um, this is something that is uh, going to be explored in the next class. I'm leaning on that to, to enable you to see just the basics and to get a grasp of what's happening. If I want to make a, a, a surface connected to this, Let's say I take this curve, but I want it to run in relationship to this surface. It has to, the curve itself has to um, 
align to the previous curve. Well, I know straight away we've not got tangency here, so I know I need to rotate the curve. That's my first thing. So I'm going to use the rotate tool. I'm going to find which one I want. There it is. And I'm going to get close to tangency. But then I've got a special tool, which is a line that gives me G2 curvature. Or, sorry, let's just call it curvature and tangent. Tangent's what I want, first of all. And that allows me to give control to this CV from this CV. So I just click where, where it's coming off. It gives me an option. Do I want the square, which is the surface, or the curve? And there it is. This is a control point. So now if I move this curve in space, if I pick the CVs, and now I want to adjust them, watch what happens. Let's go into the end view. This snaps back. But the other two aren't. But now if I say, OK, that's not what I want, but it's OK. We'll leave it like that. Let's have a look in 3D what the other curves have done. OK, they're doing something very strange. <laughs> the, CV, the, sorry, the CVs have done something very strange. But this is still tangent. OK, let's see what that's done. So if I take that curve, now that has the same relationship as that curve to this. So I don't have to align it. It's good practice, too, when you begin. But now I'm going to make another square. So I'm going to take the same curve here. Control copy, control D. Set pivot, move. Boom. It should be touching. We just check. And here I'm going to create another square. So one side, two side. And that time I chose the surface, because I'm building a surface. And then diagnostically shade. OK. And we don't have a very good connection there. This is where these control points come in. Now, if I wanted to have a better, cleaner highlight through that, I would have to change the curve to a 5 degree to have curvature. So I'm going to do that. And I'm deleting the history as I go along. And let's see what that does now. So I'm going to get rid of that surface. <laughs> so I'm going to build that surface again. And in the control box of the square, it's G1 tangent, but I'm going to change it to G2 curvature. And look, it's completely moved away from where that curve was, because I didn't hold position on these other curves. But let's have a look, see what that's done. And now we have a very different relationship between the surfaces, and the highlights are now flowing. So now we have something quite nice happening. OK. If I want it to, if it will, hold to these curves that I originally created, pick the surface, query edit it, Let's see it's side one, position. And it's added math. And side three, position. And look, it's caused all sorts of nasty problems. <laughs> so we go into explicit control. We give it some more math this way. And we've achieved it. So by using explicit control, I can adjust the math that's the same over here. But this loses my history. This retains my history. And we can have a look at the construction of the surface. And there it is. So these are hulls, and these are CVs. OK, so that's basic surfacing. It, it gets more and more involved. The, I'm going over time. So I'm going to very quickly run through the rest of the presentation. OK, so you should now look. You should now see some of the basics of Alias Automotive Interface, how to translate 2D sketch to 3D curves, how to use Alias Editing Tools and Surface Creation Tools. The rule of PSD is what we've also covered, and also treasuring a part of your model. So hardware shade, shaders, um, this is a very important feature. I mean, it's something that you can look in the handout and go into a little bit more. If I um, quickly go into alias, I can pull open the file. So here it is. So this is my surface, surface uh, model. If 
I press the hotkey F2, it brings up my shaders. I can pick a surface and apply a color and a material. Sun. Um, what we have is in is a yes. You can you can create a an environment that's available to you uh, through alias. But what I tend to do is create a gradient background that allows me to reflect the surface. As you can see, there's a reflection going on now, and a gradient background. Again, this is in the handout, just in case I, I run over time, which I have done. So shaders. And then this is part three, which is basically creating the impactful visual. That's going into that. And then camera angle. This is a really cool one. I'm just going to go into it very, very quickly. So so the final model. So here we can see um, a dramatic perspective. And that's all down to the camera angle that this is set at. So I can create a real drama with what I'm, what I'm showing. So this isn't a quick uh, model. This is not a, a rough model to then sketch over. This is something where I'm really exploring the 3D object, the model itself, um, and getting better at alias. As I said, this is my second model, and I'm really getting to town um, with uh, alias and uh, you know there's still intersections that I haven't fully completed um, but at the moment I'm just exploring it but I'm working my fillets and working my shaders and my materials and really exploring alias in a creative fashion so going back I want to wrap up So exporting an image in alias from autom automotive alias is something I can very quickly show. It's also in the handout, but I'll show that very, very quickly. Go here, export, screen, choose the image type. Oh, actually, ignore screen, file, export, current window. So you've set your image. Let's say you set the perspective of the model that you want, for example, Let's say I want something very dramatic, like the beginning picture, the beginning of the presentation, like this. OK, I like it. Current window. I want a TIFF. Specify the image size. Maintain the aspect ratio so you don't get any squish. Enable anti-alias so that it outputs an image without the jagged edges. And then up the image size, go and save it on the desktop. There it is. And we have something we can paint on, we can draw on, we can print out, and we have a dramatic image that we can edit. All right, so the final exported image that I produced for this. There's no Photoshop touch-up or Sketchbook Pro touch-up or anything. It's just a really nice visual, exaggerated camera angle, um, which should excite. Any more questions? Um, you, it's a relationship between how you adjust your surfaces. If you want to keep control of your surfaces, you should keep control of your curves. They relate to each other. If you delete your curves and want to just work with your surface, that's possible too. Corrupting, not, re not usually, no. But you want to keep the math simple. Two degree, three degree, five degree curves. Don't go any higher. No edit points on the curves. And 
Thank you very much to all of you patiently listening to my presentation. I talk a lot. I hope it was interesting. <laughs> um, and if you could come back after lunch, we have a very exciting presentation from Julian Montuse, Making the Discovery um, Clear Oxygen Design. And my contact info, if you want a business card, I have one here. And I'm happy to answer questions on the presentation. And again, there's a lot of information on the handout that goes into detail. Thank you very much.